Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation is Safety at the Face. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. To ensure you have optimal audio, sorry, to ensure you have optimal audio, please make sure you have selected the correct button. If you joined by computer, select the computer audio button. If you joined by phone, select the phone button. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the questions will be held until the end of the presentation or the discussion, and uh, they will be at the Q&A period. Note that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. And I'm very happy to have Nelson von Erdjuk with us, both to host and to um, make this series happen. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and thanks to everybody uh, attending today and joining us online. And if you're watching at home after the fact, uh, thanks for clicking and, uh, and partaking. Um, this episode of the Safety Share will be an open conversation about industrial health and safety at the face in an underground mining environment in particular, um, and with a focus on fatality prevention. The disconnect between expectation and reality of the plan and how, how to close that gap of what's discussed on surface um, usually with folks who don't go underground that often, um, and how things tend to unfold in the underground at the face. And so today, our guest interviewer, Roy Slack, Director of Cementation Americas and Director of Torx Gold, um, and our guest speakers are um, Amanda and Sandor Bassa, who are career underground miners and know firsthand how hard critical injuries and fatalities are uh, on the people directly involved their loved ones, and the ripple effects these events have on communities where mines operate. So today they'll share their stories from the mine, giving us perspective on safety from someone working underground in a day-to-day -day, uh, environment, day in and day out, um, and challenging, you know, and the challenges the industry uh, must tackle on our, on our journey to zero harm. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over um, to Roy, Amanda, and Sandor. Welcome. Thanks, Nelson. Thanks, Nelson. Thank you, Nelson. And, and uh, uh, it's great to be here and uh, moderating. As I often joke with Nelson, the, I'm the immoderate moderator, but moderating this discussion. And that's what it is, a discussion. And in fact, Sandor and Amanda and I have had discussions before uh, about safety, about women in mining, about different things. So I know them a little bit, but the, we're going to delve into a little deeper into some of the uh, aspects of safety that, that Nelson mentioned. And uh, I'll just get started by thanking both Sandor and Amanda for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, uh, your time and your and your thoughts on this topic. Uh, and maybe I'll I'll start out with Amanda, and just for the for the audience's sake. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background and how you got into mining. And I know you're both very passionate about safety and what what drives that passion about safety? Yeah, right. Um, I started about 17 years ago and I didn't wake up one morning and be like, hey, I want to be a miner. <laughs> I just kind of stumbled into it. Um, so yeah, 16, 17 years of underground mining. Uh, it's probably the last six years. Um, I've been become more passionately about uh, safety uh, with regards to, I had my, my own accident. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just, it was at the face and um, I think overall in my all my years, probably the last six years have been uh, played a huge key in my my safety, passion of safety. 
Yes, and and of course I'm I'm familiar with that with that incident, and and uh, uh, we see too many people injured at the mm -hmm. face, particularly uh, from falls of ground. And I know that was it was a close call. You were injured, but it was, it could have been far worse. It was a close call, that's for sure. Yeah, it definitely could have been a fit, fatal, fatality. Sorry. Um, I guess with my experience too, I was able to uh, react which prevented the fatality. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, with, with everything that had happened, I have taken responsibility over the years of coming to terms with my accident. Um, and it's important that when I meet new minors or anybody today that I, I talk about my accident, because not only could it possibly prevent an accident? I think as well as it's a way of me kind of dealing with my accident as well. So yeah. well now and now I'm already going off script because but you, you said some interesting things there. And one of them you, you mentioned because of your experience it wasn't worse. But if if that had have happened in the first few months of you working underground in the first six months or maybe even a year, it could mm -hmm. have been a very different outcome. Oh, definitely, for sure, yes. <clears throat> yeah, because okay. by then, when I had my accident, I had already had about 12 years under my belt of mining, so I was used to prepping the face. I've done it lots, um, so it was nothing out of the norm. normal. Um, I know that day I did have a feeling in my gut something was wrong. And of course, I look back at that. I didn't listen to that. I think the whole outcome of it was really, it just boiled down to uh, re not refusing work and um, as well as peer pressure. Okay, well, so, so now I'm going to get back on script. <laughs> okay. And 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 Sandor, I got the same question for you because I know you're passionate about safety. You've been a, a a career miner and you've been involved in supervision. So give us a bit of background about yourself. I uh, I've been started mining oh in my late teens. Grew up in a mining town. My dad was a stepfather was a career supervisor. Grew up north of Thompson and and I started going underground as young as probably nine, 10. My uh, my dad and I, we never did a lot together, never fished, anything like that. But one thing he would do, uh, back then they were working days, graveyards and afternoons. And uh, he he started taking me down there. He'd have to go check pumps and stuff like that on weekends. And I think he did it to try to convince me to not get into mining and just made me <laughs> want to do it more. So well, I, I started pretty young. Um, one thing I remember pretty clear at a really young age was, uh, I remember when we had fatalities in mining and I can remember a few growing up and, and probably as young as eight nine nine years old and I don't remember names I don't remember the specifics of, of what happened but I remember the impact on a, on our community and uh, I, the entire community the impact on on my stepdad and watching him you know sit at the table and cry and like it the the impact that that they had on everybody uh, kind of you know, it really stuck with me over the years. And I, I knew if I was going to get into mining that uh, that was something that I wanted to work on changing. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely something I remember. Um, And uh, what was the second part of the question, Roy? I, I got Just, lost. Uh, probably that was part of it because I, I was interested in what drove your passion for safety and, I, and the early fatalities that you were exposed to is one thing. But I know you've been very vocal and passionate about safety over the years. Sure, and and uh, like the biggest thing with me, and I, I've been involved in, uh, I've been first on scene of fatalities, and and I've been around a long time. And it's usually always something that comes down to a split second decision, something that you know, not making two way contact. Not it, it's it's usually never that in the inexperienced miner. It's people with experience. It's people with the how and they just take don't take that second to uh to actually stop and think and look at what they're doing and 
And uh, so, I mean, that's definitely my biggest passion in mining is fatality prevention and trying to get people to take, take that second and stop and think, hey, like, reflect on what they're doing and, and uh, that's where we need to go. Sure. Well, yeah, I remember that, and that, that's similar to, to my early experiences. And uh, the thing I remember about fatalities early in my career is the, the, the o older miners accepted it yeah. like it was part of the job and for those of us just entering the industry this was the late 70s and early 80s it was hard to believe that people could accept that and of course things have changed a lot now it's uh, uh but uh but yeah the uh the, the impact that those had on on people and and, and uh, uh, so there's lots of work to try and change that well and people don't I don't know if people don't really realize far that impact goes it's not just direct family or direct worker involved i mean it's it's an entire community and it's an entire mine it's an entire you know everybody is affected one way or another i uh i was uh <clears throat> working uh out west maybe well it'd be six seven years ago now and uh we had a fatality and uh it was a good friend um i was his son and uh, it was just one of those things, a split second decision, made a wrong choice. And I actually didn't even know if I'd be able to continue mining after that. I took uh, to take six months off and really reflect on <clears throat> on what I wanted to do. And uh, it, was, it was a tough one for me. And that was kind of where I made a turn in my, in, in my career. And, and uh, especially for myself, how I worked and, and how I assess risks and what were acceptable risks and what weren't acceptable risks it, it, they change you you're, you're involved in a fatality or critical injury I mean they change you for sure and hopefully it's for the good because we, we want something positive to come out of any injury or fatality so yeah well, I find that interesting and and the uh, the last show was was talking about mental health and the these traumatic events impact like you said impact everyone and uh and how do we recover from that and and some people don't and some people recover with a passion to safety and to prevent those so that's the interesting point I, i'm going to go to the next question now and we we've segued into it because you've been talking about fatalities and and when it comes to critical injuries and fatalities but but serious injuries too uh what challenges are we facing today at the face? And, and and I've framed it that way because I think a lot of people in the audience are involved in safety, but maybe from a corporate perspective, maybe in terms of administrating safety programs, but uh, most of us aren't working at the face. Yeah. So, so I'll, um, and maybe Sandor, maybe you can start this time. We'll, we'll switch up the order. So. Well, I, for sure, I, I, I truly, truly believe that for the most part, the industry has given us all the tools we need. They've given, they've given the workers all the necessary tools. They know the right thing to do. They, they, any safety device they need, it's there for them. Um, but I think it's, it really comes down to the making that choice. It comes down to a mental choice of, of you know, whether it's a, a one-minute job working from five meters up. You know the right thing to do. You know you got to die. You know it's about making that choice and doing the right thing. And I think that's, I think that's one of the hardest things to overcome when it comes to fatality prevention and, and critical injury prevention. Is we could uh, engineer all the devices we want, but how do you change somebody's mental perspective on how they view risk? Right? Like, and that's a tough, that's a tough challenge, and it's been around a long time. Like. You know the old school way of mining slowly going away but still that it's hard it's hard to get rid of that for sure he's a and while you were saying that i was thinking about raising teenagers and i remember my kids and you want them to make the right choices and you coach them as much as you can and sometimes they make wrong choices uh and and learn from it and sometimes they don't learn anyway i'm getting uh off on a tangent here but, but uh, it's, it's almost like workers get to the, 
they'll convince themselves that they can beat the risk or that it's an acceptable risk, right? They'll say to themselves, well, it's only a 30 second jump. I've done it before. I can get up there and do it, right? Or I've done this a thousand times. Like I could do it again one more time. I'll be okay. And they, the workers will convince themselves that that risk is beatable and that they can, you know, get the job done. Where we need to get to a point where it, they, they don't have to think that. Just do it right, do it safe, do it the right way. <laughs> Um, you know, mend people on safety and doing things the right way. Give people pats on the back for actually taking the time to get a lanyard and, or, or you know, whatever they got to do to make that job safe. Like uh, that, that whole mentality of the old school way of mining of, uh, well, it's a night shift job or, you know, we'll take care of it on nights or nobody's around. Let's get it done quickly. Eliminating that is, is always going to be your, your biggest challenge. Right? And then that's kind of becomes part of a safety culture where, you know, that, that kind of mentality will spread from one guy to another to another. Like, I think it's getting better. And it's definitely from when I started in the mid 90s to what mining is now, it's come a long way. But I think to reach, if we're ever going to reach zero fatalities and zero critical injuries, it all comes down to mental and, 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 and making the right choices. Yeah, it's, uh, I made a note here uh, because one thing you said, and I might be paraphrasing here, but uh, uh, people said, well, I've always done it this way. And I got thinking, what if the safe way was the way we've always done it? Wouldn't that be great? I guess that's where we're trying to head to. But uh, uh, Amanda, I'm, uh, same same question for you. What challenges do you think we're facing when it comes to preventing these serious injuries and fatalities at the face? Um, I think uh, one thing that really comes to mind is uh, the old school mentality. Uh, sometimes needs to change, like it needs to still be changed um, because you got the jumbo operators that are still kind of uh, in that mentality of that it's okay to do stuff like i remember back in the days when i first started prepping face and i would have a the jumbo operator drilling over my head while i went and grabbed the lifters i was told that's how i was told do go do that while i'm drilling and that's what, how i learned right and obviously it's the wrong way to do it you know but just small things like that um it really comes down to the leader of the team and 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 showing us the proper ways of doing stuff too to make a big difference yeah no i and yeah it's the, the term old school and and it's interesting because some, some people like to talk about working old school in terms of work ethic but when it mm -hmm. comes to safety i think we we have a far different understanding of what old school means you know cracking yeah. the whip and, and uh, eyeballing and, and whatever it takes to get the job done. Yeah. I see, I see Nelson has joined us now. So there's something happening, something gonna happen. I'm back to, uh, we're gonna flip the script a little bit and pass it over to the audience to give us their input. Uh, we've got two polls today and this is the first one. Um, and of course the question on the screen, what are the most common causes of fatal incidents underground? based on your experience. So if you're in the audience and you're available, let's uh, see what comes back. Hey, how come how come our panelists can't vote? What's going on here? <laughs> you get to talk the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at about 60, 70% voted. We're gonna let that go a little bit longer. So far, so good. Um, so so far, out of the out of the four choices: fall ground, fire explosion, equipment failure, malfunction, human error, unsafe behavior. Seventy-one percent of the respondents so far are saying uh, human error, unsafe behavior, and twenty-four fall fall ground. Twenty-four percent fall ground, with the other four percent covering the other two topics. Right. So that's an interesting. It, that that's the game that you know Sandra you just mentioned that about getting your head in the game and then and then Amanda talked about how she was taught right that's it seems to be the biggest part is is making sure that number one we're 
for getting our every head in the game in the right way around risk culture and and ultimately building up to a positive safety culture and then a fall of ground right ground supports key well when you look at uh like your three biggest causes of fatalities underground we're always going to be fall from heights fall of ground our interaction with heavy equipment pedestrian on equipment right but all three of those are mental choices right it's making the choice not to have two-way positive contact with heavy equipment it's making that choice not to properly tie off or make sure that it's safe right so it is all it is, your biggest cause is mental even though that it's yeah that's a, that's a very good point because i was I, I was trying to look at which which one was which but that one you're right sandor is involved in everything that's right uh, it is and every fatality it's very rare do you have a fatality underground where it's well nothing could have been done right how often does that happen a rock burst maybe uh, but it's very very rare that we ever have a serious injury or fatality where we say man there's nothing else. Yeah. always sorry. i think i think the industry in, has gone through stages and at one point uh, it was all about process we felt we could design things out and, and then it was about culture and we're still working on it we're still looking for that that next step change but anyway i'm the i'm the interviewer here i'm not supposed to be talking too much but uh oh, you right yeah. i'm passionate about too so i think too uh, it's gonna be like the, the, the one of the things to stop is like we keep talking about old school way right old school mining old, old school safety is is stopping that from getting passed down to yeah. the next miners right because that old school, it's with guys my age, it's with guys in their 60s, 50s, stopping that from getting passed down to these next generations, right? And and that's that's a challenge too, because those guys look up to the older guys. Those guys do what those guys are going to do, right? And so that's experience. Uh, it's breaking that chain that that is going to be a challenge. Well, and and that'll lead me into our next question because we're going to talk a bit about super. <laughs> And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Amanda and and uh, we've talked before about how important supervision is to culture. Here's a question I didn't have on the list: Has Sandor ever been your supervisor? He tries. <laughs> <laughs> She's a supervisor here. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that's a good answer. Good answer. Uh, but let's let's talk about supervision and safe work culture because we know it's so important and uh, what's happening today? What do you guys see at the face? And and I'll start with Amanda and Sandra. I'm going to ask you a bit of a different question because you uh, you have done some supervision as well, if I understand. But uh, but Amanda, I'll start with you. Supervision. Supervision. I mean, what what they can do. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. I get I get rambling a bit there, uh, but. Uh, how important supervision is to safe work culture, and we're we're talking about prevention of, of uh, serious injuries and uh, what's working and what's not working today when it comes to supervision and safety at the face. Okay, well, what definitely I think personally what's working is uh, the shifter actually you know checking up on their their workers and making sure that they are using the correct equipment they are using the the tools they need to get the job done quickly um is what's not working is uh some shifters out there turning a blind eye hoping that the job gets done they don't care how it gets done that it gets done um, and just don't get hurt. Um, and I see, actually, I've been throughout the six months I've worked at, I, I've seen it uh, happen. And, and that's what's not working is that mentality again, that, you know, you got experience, I know you know how to do the job, but are they checking up to making sure the job's done correctly? Um, I think is a big, a big key and communication as well so if uh if a supervisor uh visits you and doesn't say anything basically they're approving 
how you're doing the work. Correct. Whether it's right or wrong. Correct. Yeah. So Sandra, okay. oh, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Sorry, and, and again, that that's our leader, right? So our leader really needs to uh, show people that this is the correct way to do things and to prevent stuff right, from maybe somebody making a different decision to do something. I think that's something we recognize when we do a, an investigation is if, if if something happens, it's mm -hmm. not the first time people have done it that way, yeah. which means people are letting it, it happen. And, and that comes back to supervision. Correct. So Sandra, Correct. you've been, in, uh, you've done a little bit of both over the years. Yeah. Uh, what's your Sorry, view can on I interrupt one more time? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the only thing I wanted to say too on that note was that, you know, a lot of workers are held accountable, but I don't, what I don't see what's working is the shifters are not being held accountable for their work ethics. And I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, for me, I, like safety starts from the top, right? Safety culture. People think that safety culture starts with the workers. It starts from managers to superintendents, down to supervisors, down to the workers. So if you have a supervisor who is, you know, ah, it's night shift, let's get it done, or well, however you do it, when I'm not here, it's okay, um, or put pressure on workers to get stuff done, even if they don't have the right tools. When workers have a, a supervisor who doesn't really care if they do things to standard if they tie off if they you know scale properly or whatever if if a supervisor if a supervisor doesn't show that he cares or that it's important the worker's not going to do it if you have a shifter who comes around and you're working five and a half six meters up not tied off or anything and doesn't care those workers aren't going to tie off if they're not getting in trouble for it they're not going to do it nine times out of ten they're not going to do it if you have a supervisor who you know as a worker that, man, if I get caught doing this, I'm in a lot of trouble. My job's on the line. I have to make sure I have the right safety devices. If you have a supervisor who actually believes in, in that and and uh, doesn't bend, your workers are gonna follow that. And I think that's a big challenge on <clears throat> what, uh, what happens on the surface and what happens in the toolbox and in safety meetings and what actually happens at the face. And I get it, you know, supervisors, superintendents, Everybody's under a lot of pressure to get the work done. It has to be done right. It has to be done safe with the proper tools and proper devices, right? But, uh, like I think that's it's a big challenge, and I think the only way to get workers to actually make those right choices is knowing that they don't have a choice. Even if it's a one-minute job, if you get caught, you're in some serious trouble if you're not tied off or if you're not doing that job properly. Like. They have to set by example. They have our lead by example, and and uh, they have to be the ones showing the workers that like there's no gray area. It's black and white when it comes to critical risk and 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 that, that kind of thing, you know. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I. I think uh, you know what uh, right just started here. And, <laughs> Well, you mentioned something that that kind of uh, resonated with me, and and I, I wrote it down as a chain of culture. And you're talking about management and supervision and, and uh, shifters and leaders. And if any one of them is a weak link, it kind of it it begins the culture begins to disintegrate. Yeah, it does for sure. And. You'll always have signs on on a on a site on, or on a, in a company or whatever. Uh, you know, injuries, incidences, they just don't happen all the time for no reason. If you're getting those kind of, you know, if you're on a site or in a company with with a lot of frequencies, a lot of injuries, a lot of high potential, there's something going on. You have to take a look at your safety culture. You have to take a look at your leaders and and what guys are actually doing because people in an office, managers. They don't know what actually is going on in the face. They don't know how guys are working. And probably 80% of the time, the supervisors don't either. They have a lot of ground to cover. They have a lot of workers to see. And so they got to hope that their workers are doing things right, right? And, and it, they just, they need to make it clear that 
it's a right way or it's a highway. Like, I mean, it, it's different if, okay, I catch a worker putting up pipe without gloves compared to catching a worker working off elevated platform, not tied off, right? I mean, the severity is quite a bit different. And when it comes to something that could end your life, better be done right. The, uh, and you know, I got thinking about that and uh, 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 the comment about being under pressure to, to produce as being part of it. And we're just, I think our industry is just starting to delve into mental health. And I've got to wonder about that constant pressure. You know, and, and I'm, I'm in contract, I've been in contracting all my career. I know the pressure to get, we used to call it footage. Now we call it meterage. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, how old I am. But uh, that, that pressure to get production has got to impact us somehow in the mental health. For sure. And you, and you think about, and, and that's a good point you brought up. because I've been noticing that too the last few months that mental health is just finally coming to mainstream for mining. But you think of how many mental health issues people bring already to work, right? That, mm -hmm. You know, we look at fit for work and people think, is he physically fit or are they intoxicated? But we very rarely look, are they mentally fit? You know, it's a tough world these days and living's tough. Everything's so expensive. You know, mental illness and anxiety, depression is, is skyrocketing. And it's definitely something that needs to have more attention paid to for sure. Well, and and uh, so so again, you you're leading me in different directions. I find I know this I'm very off topic here. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm the one that's going off topic because you, there's things that come up that I find very interesting. And maybe I'll ask Amanda about like the the supervisors that I really uh, respected and looked up to are ones that got to know me a little bit and and interacted and, and I knowing your people is so important in terms of understanding their uh, fit for work. And like you say, Sandor, it's not whether they're intoxicated or under the influence, it's whether they're mentally fit for work. But mm -hmm. Amanda, what's, what were the, I'd say, attributes of your best supervisor? You know, if you remember someone, and we're not naming names, we're, we're not gonna flatter anyone. It was me, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, there is one that stands out. Uh, he is passed on, but uh, he told me he'd take me under his wing. This is before I even started on a scoop. And he definitely, uh, you know, would give me trouble and always be on my case, you know, and oh, there's rocks on the ground. And it's like, oh, that's just kitty litter. I'll clean that up, you know, leaving messes. So he was on me quite a bit and he really played a big role in to where I am today as well. Yeah. But the, you know, when there's, I can't remember how the saying goes, but the, uh, you know, you're in trouble if your supervisor never says anything to you. So, so the fact that they were, that, uh, that supervisor was, uh, I'll say coaching. I'm sure you thought it was different at the time. They, oh like, yeah, I'd be like, oh no, here he comes again. <laughs> what am I, what am I gonna get in trouble for now? <laughs> but no, he he actually definitely, you know, guided me and showed me and pushed me, and I am who I am today because of him. So I, I'm definitely grateful for that. Yeah, one thing a a good supervisor has to be able to do is is know how to approach every worker you're not going to be able to approach every worker the same, right? Everybody's different. You can talk to, you're not going to be, you can talk to one worker one way, but you might not be able to talk to the, the next worker the other way. Yeah. But you got to be approachable. And, and like, mm -hmm. uh, especially like we were, we were just talking about fit for work and mental illness. If a worker has an issue going on and you're the kind of supervisor that isn't approachable, you don't want to take time to talk to workers. If a worker stops you, you're like, oh, you know, I got to go, I'm in a hurry. They're not going to tell you what's going on, and that those are some of the biggest things for preventing uh, fatalities and critical injuries. Because as we just talked earlier, they every one comes down to usually a mental error, right? So how do you see if somebody's not fit for work if you if you don't take the time to talk to them, and if you're not approachable for them to come talk to you? And I think that's very you know important as a, as a supervisor and something I've been trying to do, and uh, 
you know, as I go forward as a supervisor, it's, it's very important to me that that I make sure I am approachable and make sure that people will talk to me because I want to know if something's going on. If a guy is, you know, having, you know, crazy things going on at home or his mind's not on the job, I don't want him getting an eight yard scoop going down a ramp. You know, I want to put him in a job where he's working with people and he can be watched, right? So these are the kind of things you need to be able to see and, and, and stop before it's too late. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I, when I hear it, it sounds so simple. Right? It's talking to people. It's like we're, we're doing now, right? Just, yeah. just talking to people and listening. And, and uh, that's how you get to know your people. And lots of supervisors, they don't take that time. And I, and I get it. It's, it's a busy day. You know, some might have 10, some might have 50 guys to go check on, but you have to make that time. You have to be approachable. And, uh, someone needs to talk to you take mm -hmm. the time i've had shifters that aren't approachable and i i would definitely try to avoid them or have a conversation with them because i was intimidated so when you're like that you're not going to be as focused like if somebody comes down and starts yelling and screaming at me I'm I'm gonna freeze and I'm not gonna know what to do and or how to react and and then I'm not even focused on my job anymore. I'm just more focused on, you know, how I don't like this person. <laughs> so it de it definitely plays a very big part, uh, for sure. And and the, the the supervisor you described, you're definitely not gonna go to them with a safety concern. No. They're coming down the drift screaming at you. Last thing you're going to do is because, uh, you know, they're just going to yell at you and tell you to take care of it. Yeah. yeah. And I think as we go ahead in mining, I think uh, mental is is going to be our biggest challenge as far as preventing fatalities and critical injuries is going to be mental health because it's just going to get worse. I mean, the cost of living is not going to get better. Like It's just it's going to be a problem that's going to grow and grow and grow. And People are going to be bringing mental challenges to work more and more and more, and it's going to be vital to to recognize those. Good. Well, I see Nelson's back on, so we have another. Uh, another. <laughs> poll number two. I figured this was a good time to come in for poll number two here, based on the discussion. Uh, and so this one's for the audience. Uh, so, which preventive control is most often overlooked underground? Adequate ventilation consistent and thorough inspection and maintenance, ongoing education and safety training for all workers, monitoring of mine atmosphere to identify hazards. And while folks are uh, adding or responding to the poll, it's interesting the discussion has shifted towards, again, getting people's heads in the games and having that supervisor as that linchpin, right? And so, you know, one of the controls in my opinion is, is a real strong program to make sure supervisors have all the soft and hard skills they need, the technical and social, if you will, um, to be performing that job at the top level. They're, they're, your, um, they're your linchpin, if you will, right? In my opinion. Okay, we've got about 67 voted. We'll give it a couple, couple more seconds here. here. I just need the ongoing education. Yeah. Can we show the results, Michelle? Most, most, no, no big surprises here, right? Ongoing education and safety training. I should have taken bets um, from our guests to see what what it come out as, but you know, over half of the folks responding are saying that ongoing safety, that constant uh, worker education and training is not just bums and seats, right? It could be, it could be in the field job task observations. It could be short videos. It's the safety share, if you do a good safety share properly with a call to action around people's heads in the game. So there's lots of different ways to to provide those little touch points on training, in my opinion. But thanks for that, Michelle. Okay, Roy, back over to you. Well, based on our discussion, we probably should have had a question there on whether supervisors need training. Uh, because uh, when it comes to, uh, and we talk about this in business, uh, the hard skills versus the soft skills, but being able to talk to your people and, and recognizing when someone's struggling, those are things that are hard to train, but they, they seem to be the most critical things when it comes to these issues. 
and, and a lot of the times it's not even I don't even think I don't even know if it's something you can train I mean I guess it is to a certain extent but a lot of the times it's just in picking the right people and and uh you know personality isn't really something you can train empathy isn't something you can train it's something you have right like yeah you can train it to a certain extent but I think personally shifters maybe a refresher course maybe like every couple of years would definitely help just get them back on track because people will fall into their old ways and forget about maybe say mental health and be like oh yeah maybe I should work on that like just you know and interact with their crew more or, you know like just a, a small refresher course maybe every two years or something might might help too for stuff like yeah, that. I mean, there's a lot of work going on right now that you know, I think the question we're getting to is, are we focusing on the right things when, you know, we're looking at mental health first aid and different things, and there's some some pretty basic things we're talking about. Right? Mm -hmm. Just talking with people and, and getting to know them. And, well, and they're, they're all things that, that require zero engineering controls, right? Like everything we're talking about for fatality prevention, critical injury prevention, comes down to people, comes down to mental awareness and, and people like uh, you know i see uh ontario's mm -hmm. investing what they say 200 million or something in 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 the work in in the workplace and and, and preventing critical injury and fatalities but i mean it's to me it's it needs to be a bigger social investment it needs to be a, a bigger investment like amanda was saying supervisors may be retrained on social skills and interaction skills and and, and stuff like that like how to deal with problems that people might have with mental illness and stuff yeah well i've got <clears throat> i've got a, a another question i want to slip in here before we uh, uh before we start to wrap up but uh uh and this is the orientation question so you're both experienced miners but what would you tell a new miner if you were talking to them today Let, uh, i'm i'm just coming to this site and i'm, I'm green as grass and i i don't know I won't use that expression. I, I don't know much. So, Amanda, what would you tell me about mining? Well, I have trained the trainers. So one thing I always, when I do train people, uh, the main thing I do recommend is communication. Always communicate. You need to communicate like a hundred times throughout the day, a thousand times throughout the day. Ask questions. If you're not sure, it doesn't matter how dummy might think the question is ask questions uh and it's always good for me to always ask questions to them to make sure we're all on the same path um that they're doing okay and, and um yeah so i i every like when i start training somebody i always make sure to ask lots of questions and tell them lots of stuff but i always ask them the questions to, to see if they can give me the pro proper response or proper reaction of what to do in this scenario and stuff like that. Okay, well, that, that's good to hear because it, I'm still asking dumb questions all these years later, so uh, so that's There's comforting. No dumb questions, just dumb answers. <laughs> <laughs> Sandor, you're, you're doing orientation, what would you tell us? A new miner. What, what she said is actually bang on it is a really good one and uh, a lot of new people um they 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 don't speak up or right? especially if they're young and stuff right they won't or ask questions the way amanda does and i've watched her do uh, train the trainer and stuff and she does ask a lot of questions and that helps get people actually thinking and maybe out of their shell a bit to ask questions that they think might be a dumb question right um what would i tell a new employee though i will be telling them to turn around go back to school no, I'm just kidding. I, I wouldn't say that. Um, definitely ask lots of questions. I, I'd want to make sure that they knew where all the emergency uh, services were, the refuge, uh, fresh air, vent uh, uh, access is refuge, and how to actually use them. You know, AEDs, first aid, how to use a FEMCO. I'd definitely, that'd be my big thing, go through emergency uh, plan and make sure they know that and where all the emergency uh, things are located, refuge. To me, that's the biggest thing, what to do in case of a fire, what to do in case of injury. And, uh, and it's not, and a lot of places too, like just 
okay, well, there's a refuge station, keep going in the Toyota, right? And that's it. But you actually have to get out, show them how to use it, show them how to use the FEMCO, make sure they know what to do if there is a fire. And, uh, yeah. So that for me, that would be my big thing uh, if I was doing orientation. But, uh, I think too, during orientation, sometimes it's just like, even after a week, they're on their own, um, or two weeks, they're on their own. It, it's still overwhelming for a greenhorn that's never been underground. And I think it's easy, to, there's so much stuff to know. Uh, there could be like two words for one thing. And the fact is it's, it's important to make sure that like to continue on to quiz in them every you know couple of weeks or a month for their first year just to make sure they how things go and mm -hmm. where stuff is and because people forget yeah that's a good point when you look at like an orientation for a new hire i mean you got a list that long right yeah they're going to forget a lot oh, of it. Yeah. They're not going to remember, you know, probably remember 20% of it. So it's good to, like she said, maybe ask them again down the road and, and see if there's anything that they're, that they're unsure of or they need help yeah. with. Well, good. Uh, Nelson, I, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to call you back now because we, uh, we're, we're getting towards the end here and I don't know if, uh, if there are questions or if you've been tracking them or uh, or yeah so so we've got a couple of questions i was letting you folks wrap up the discussion i was about to come on in the next two minutes or so but um uh we have two questions one of them actually we have four four questions come in throughout two of them were answered um one of them had a great comment about you know what leadership accepts is what they approve right that was earlier in the discussion we we're talking about what's working what's not um, and then there's a uh, question in here around, uh, so first off, they open with a great point, Sandor, on the approach uh, to workers. And, and I believe they're, you know, coming at it from a supervisor's perspective, we're not selected or trained on the psychological preparedness um, as part of the selection process, right? Uh, and so I guess the, what, I, what I see in that comment there is really a question around what what could companies do differently to help prepare those supervisors for that for that burden of looking after a crew of people and watching out for their mental health i think that uh, i th i think it'd be good to have programs in place where, where you could actually send supervisors for training on on social awareness how to interact with different types of personalities and, and uh, with different people and and I think that's something that gets a little bit overlooked, right? We look at a resume and what does he bring to the table for experience, but really it's not something that ever gets asked or, or you know, that you're qualified for. It's just something you find out on the job and that a, a supervisor might not have. So I think uh, I think if there were some kind of training programs for supervisors to deal with just different types of people, every person is different, right? And, and how to go into those situations and talk to people get what you need out of them and for them to get what they need out of you is it I, I and you know i found that kind of tough when i started supervising was just i was one thing was everybody's so different and how I, I learned pretty fast that how i approach one person i'm not going to be able to approach the other person the same way you know i don't know i think some kind of program would be good i think one size does not at all right one size yeah, it's it, it's true and and uh, you know just being able to talk to your people uh, that would go a long way with uh, with uh, good communication and, and people coming to you with with problems so there's another question here um and there's a little bit of a uh, some context i'll give you folks some context so you know um, somebody's asking have we heard about the dunning dunning kruger effect right and and is lack of training uh, you know, for instance, the 10,000 hours to become an expert part of the problem. Like, do we not have enough training? Uh, it sounds like that seems to be one of the issues. And, and and again, with training, we're not necessarily talking about bums and seats, but what kind of skills are we helping those supervisors build? Um, and so the last part of that question is, do we do we put people into situations that are ill-equipped to process because we can't afford the manpower we need for proper training? 
or is it something else? That's a good question. <laughs> I think it's just a lack of, maybe it's a lack of improper training. I mean, uh, as a when you get into supervision, you don't know that those problems exist until you get into it. You don't know, you don't realize how many different people and personalities you have to deal with it until you actually get into it. So it's not something that, you know, uh, like you can bring with 10,000 hours of work. It's just, I think a lot of times just either the person has it or they don't. And really without like, like it kind of, this kind of ties into the last question without any kind of uh, like social training or anything. How do you get that? How do you get a person to have that, right? Like, I don't know, it's, it's a tough question. Like it's not something you're gonna have from, you know, 10,000 hours underground working at a face. It's something you're gonna bring to a table with experience working with people. And dealing with problems with people right i mean that's where you build that experience is that kind of what they were asking nelson or yeah i, I think so it, you know we're back to this you know training such a monolithic term right it just covers so many things and people have their own definition and i know per, from personal experience you know working in mexico for the last 10 years is when you get into those discussions and you have two different languages going on you actually realize there's more words, like Amanda said earlier, there's more words for the same thing, but people look at things a little bit differently. So it's really important to do that, that extra communication, get on, get on the same page. And for the folks that are on the webinar that design these systems, people like myself that aren't necessarily underground all the time anymore or working at the face daily, it's good to get out there and have some discussions with folks and collect, you know, people's thoughts on what's happening. So you can design that system to be simple, clear, and, and overall effective, right? So we've got three more questions that have come in while I've been talking. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, what is the single most important thing for mine leadership to get correct to enable a world-class safety culture? Can you repeat that, Nelson? I, I, I missed part of that. So what, what's, the, what's the single most important thing for mine leadership to get right to allow for a world-class safety culture? Well, <clears throat> monkey see, monkey do, right? So <clears throat> that's pretty much how I can put it. For sure, lead by example. I mean, yeah. uh, mean what you say, say what you mean. If something is the rules on the surface, then it's the rules at the face, and it's the rules everywhere under them. There's no different rules from being in the meeting room to at the face, you 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 live by what you what the rules are and uh, lead by example. I mean, uh, set set clear rules. Well, set and that's it. Like if and that goes with supervisors, the leaders, because the the, the lead, crew leader and the supervisors that that's who people are going to follow. So if it's you know just words in a meeting, but underground it's a free for all. Let's get it done. Yeah, that's how the workers are going to work. Yeah, I've heard this before, and I think the last time I heard it was um, my current my current boss Jody Kazanko at Torex, and and she says, you know, leaders, especially the supervisors, are energy transformers, right? Your job when you see the team down or team members on your team down is to transform that energy up. And if people are too high and and in a rush and thinking way ahead of the game and skipping steps, your job is to step that energy down and level things off and keep it consistent, right? And and, and that comes down to again to knowing your workers interacting with your workers and talking to them knowing their personalities knowing if something's off you know you should be able to know if something's wrong with one of your one of the employees that day right because that's how you're going to prevent to uh, prevent something really bad from happening yeah. it's, it's very difficult i i've had to do it twice in my career is is uh, let go of a very experienced project superintendent because they were uh they were prone to take shortcuts and they they didn't hide it they felt it was uh part of their job to get the job done and and uh but over 40 years that twice i had to do that and it's it's difficult and in contracting sometimes the client likes that superintendent so and then you got to talk to the client and convince them too but uh, but uh you have to do it or else your whole operation is jeopardized yeah. 
Okay, we've got two more here, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. We've got about five minutes left. So um, here's a good one. We might just end with this based on how long this takes us to answer. But do rewards for meeting safety goals improve safety? Like, do they help it or do they hurt it? I think they help it. I mean, people get pat on the back all the time for, for big meters and for, you know, whatever, getting the round. But how many times do they get a pat on the back for tying off, for getting the proper devices needed for doing the, doing the job safe? I think that is, is more important to me. I mean, I think there should be, it doesn't have to be a, a physical reward, but a, a supervisor saying to a worker, hey, great job on having all your rails on your, on your steer deck and being tied off and having everything you need. That's awesome to see. That goes a long way. Okay. Right? Even just telling a person good job goes a long way. It does. doesn't actually have to be a physical reward. Like so more that. general, it's it's recognition. It's not <laughs> for sure not necessarily a reward, but uh, or a bonus or anything. But that recognition is important. Employees oh, like yeah. to to hear a good job, and the, you know if if they hear a good job on doing things safely and and having the proper tools and devices, maybe they'll continue that trend. Well, definitely. Sorry, a positive reinforcement goes a long way. Go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> I know one thing that kind of quite a bit is uh, safety bonus being attached, right? That can uh, this is definitely hard because then you got people that don't want to report stuff because otherwise they'll lose their bonus, right? So that is, I find, a little tricky area. And not only that, if if you have somebody that gets hurt and now an entire group lost their safety bonus because of one person, now there's gonna be resentment, there's gonna yeah. be animosity, and it creates bad culture, right? Like, and I, you see it in mining all the time, safety bonuses. And I think they, uh, for sure, they bring numbers down, but like Amanda said, a lot of the times, people won't re report injuries. They're not gonna report, you know, near misses, injuries, if, if they think that it might take away bonus from everybody, they're definitely not gonna do it. Yeah. We it's used to have, uh, one of my early days in a mine, we used to have these things called safety bucks they would give out every month if nobody got injured. And so I was a brand new supervisor, green as they come, and one of the one of the electricians was walking by and he was hobbling a little bit, then he saw me and he tried to straighten out and he twisted his back moving a ladder, right? Um, to get up to change a, change a, one of those metal halide lights in the in the plant on the work order and uh, I said what's going on and he's like oh nothing and he didn't want to be the guy that broke the street and cost everybody their their safety bucks right so that's uh it's you know the rewards versus recognition I think there's two different words there it's supposed to, it's it's important to be clear with those but uh you know recognition does go a long way right in my experience I always like getting a pat on the back personally <laughs> when yeah. you, you do something right, you get some positive encouragement, right? So yeah, like anyway. I, I think I think monetary well, has you know it has its good and it, and it definitely has its bad. It, I guess it's just the, depends on how it's used. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I personally don't think it should be in the workplace monetary bonuses for safety, but uh, I think you just gave me an idea for a future webinar on on how to design a. It, 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 it's just a it, it, it's a tough thing right and i've seen it man i've seen it lots where mm -hmm. guys are going mm -hmm. every worker hates that guy because that yeah. guy took away five six bucks an hour from everybody else so now that guy is a black sheep nobody wants to talk to him yeah he feels terrible right how do you stop that yeah so it, so Sandra, it's time for that guy to become a supervisor <laughs> that's, that's right that's good right <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I see Michelle's come on the screen, so that's the cue to wrap things up, folks. I'd like to thank you all for for joining us today. It's been a it's been a great discussion, and and definitely one of the more engaging ones from from my end. Um, I would like to just get a quick plug in. Uh, you know, if you're enjoying the series so far and you're on the line listening in, um, I highly recommend that you you join the CIM and sign up as your your preferred society being the health and safety society we're looking to really really share a lot of these ideas right across the board and raise the standard for safety around the industry 
Um, because as we've talked about today, we still got a long way to go. We've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. Um, so again, Sandor and Amanda, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to all our attendees. And of course, thanks to Roy for leading that discussion and moderating it uh, in such a skillful way. Um, I think at the end here, I will turn it over to Michelle for the wrap up. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nelson. And thank you, Roy and Sandor and Amanda. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to this video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon, along with a registration link for our next episode of the Safety Share, where we will be discussing severe injury and fatality prevention. It's on Thursday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time, and we hope to see you then. You can find a listing of the latest CIM virtual events on our calendar of events at cim.org. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks Michelle. Thanks so much. Take care. I think